Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research, SEMF from its original Spanish acronym, is created in response to the current scientific, social and technological environment. Despite the fast communications and interconnectivity of the information age, most branches of knowledge are still largely segregated, and institutions dedicated to their advancement tend to be managerially complex, often constrained by their history and rarely in substantial cooperation with each other. This contrasts with recent developments, showing that today's frontiers of human understanding often lie outside the bounds of traditional disciplines. SEMF aims to address fundamental questions with rigour and honesty, always striving to consider them broadly, profoundly and contextually. We believe that this type of intellectual endeavour is most likely to flourish in dynamic environments that foster the creative exploration of ideas and the organic growth of research projects and collaborations. SEMF aspires to provide such an environment by keeping things simple, staying managerially lightweight and being run by a team of active researchers and intellectuals. At SEMF, we promote rationality and scientific thinking across all human inquiry, since we consider these to be the best tools for development of civilization and the understanding of the universe we all inhabit. Our universalist approach to human knowledge helps us bridge the gap between traditionally disjointed disciplines, particularly the familiar yet limiting divide between the sciences and humanities. This mindset allows us to identify deep themes across diverse topics, a powerful asset when trying to unify separate areas of research. Ultimately, SEMF aims to establish a pluralistic community of scientists, creatives, academics, artists, students, intellectuals and generally enthusiasts united under the common goal of delving deeper into fundamental questions. In principle, all topics are welcome under the SEMF dome. However, given its fundamental nature, subjects such as linguistics, physics, cognitive science, mathematics, complexity science, philosophy, biology or computer science are well represented in our events and activities. To accomplish our goals, we currently do three things. We ideate and organise transdisciplinary conferences and seminars. We host the SEMF Queer podcast, where small groups of experts with different backgrounds come together to discuss a transversal topic. And we maintain the Agora, a platform implemented on Discord and Telegram, where our members can self-organise and participate in talks, debates, study groups and social gatherings. All the information about SEMF can be found on our website, www.semf.org.es. There you can also become a member in a couple of clicks. In our YouTube channel, you can find our live streams and podcast recordings. And follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with all our events and announcements and find us on most other social media platforms. All right, welcome everybody to episode number four of the San Filokia podcast. Uh, I'm delighted to have Vicente, Mandy, and Miguel here with me today. Um, we are, of course, going to talk about plan cognition, as you can see from the title. And I should, first of all, uh, mention that this is a, a very dear topic to me because uh, in the very beginning of the of the SEM, the SEMF project, we, we had a, a, a contact with Paco Calvo, which I think uh, Vicente Raja and Miguel Sondra know very well here. And uh, he, he was very enthusiastic at the very beginning of SEMF. We were still sort of ideating uh, the, the whole uh, project to go international and try to aim for uh, interdisciplinary conferences and, and sort of inviting all kinds of profiles. Uh, he was immediately very, uh, very supportive and, and he reached out to us saying, oh, we'd like to be uh, involved in somehow. And so he came and, and gave a, a talk in about plan cognition extensively, but in Spanish. That was uh, a bit uh, a bit over a year ago now, and uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to finally have a, a proper plan cognition event in the current SEMF. So today is the day when we finally tackle the, the the topic. It will not be the last time for sure, but uh, I'm delighted to uh, to to be uh, um, tackling it today. So uh, let me uh, very briefly uh, introduce our speakers today. So we have uh, Vicente Raja. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Rodman Institute of Philosophy at Western University in Canada. Uh, his research lies at the intersection of philosophy, cognitive science, neuroscience, and the history of sciences of the mind. 
Um, his theoretical work uh, develops a framework for the study of brain-body environment systems based on ecological resonance, and his experimental work complements his theoretical work on ecological resonance and combines the use of nonlinear methods and virtual reality or sensory substitution devices to study human and plant behavior. Welcome, Vicente. Uh, thank you. Very happy to be here. Thank you. And we also have uh, Miguel Segundo Ortin. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, I had a wonderful time at Utrecht actually a few years ago that I was visiting there for differential geometry in my case. Um, he specializes in the philosophy of the cogn of cognitive sciences uh, with a special emphasis on embodied and situated theories of cognition. Other research interests include the study of so-called minimally cognitive agents, uh, the explanation of skill performance, and the relationship between culture and cognitive development. At the moment, he is part of the research project uh, with Amarin Kallis, uh, which studies the learning and development of self-controlling human beings and is a member of the Minimal Intelligence Lab at the University of Murcia, where, of course, Paco is leading, and, and that's the reference. Um, so welcome, very much. welcome today, uh, Miguel. Thank you so much for the invitation. Just for the record, Vicente is also a member of the of the Minimal Intelligence Lab. Yes, so uh, yes. two representatives, <laughs> representatives of that. Absolutely. Um, very pleased to have a representation of the <laughs> Minimal Intelligence here. I mean, it's uh, really wonderful. And uh, finally, my co-host today here, Mandi, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's a fellow associate of SEMF, so he's uh, also uh, under, under the house, uh, under the hood of, of, of the SEMF dome. Uh, so he uh, has a master's in data science, a uh, bachelor in neuroscience and cellular biology, biology uh, has some formal background in theoretical computer science and logic. Uh, he's interested in potential axiomatic foundations of biophysics, uh, artificial life, and the intersection of biology with logic and computation. Welcome, Mandy. Nice to meet everybody. So um, today we're going to uh, delve into the depths of, uh, of cognitive science and the uh, foundations of uh, mind science, uh, eventually plant cognition, we'll talk about all these things. Um, so I, I am particularly excited to have such a naturally interdisciplinary topic. I mean, a lot of people, as you know, uh, mentioned cognitive science as one of the quintessential uh, de facto multidisciplinary uh, uh, disciplines or, or areas. And many people also claim about the failure of, of such a discipline to be properly multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary. So uh, I guess that will be one of the topics that we can discuss at the very end. Uh, be but before that, I think Mandy is going to uh, sort of uh, lead us into the, into the, the, the first initial uh, themes today. So please, Mandy, take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, so any listeners and uh, people who have been following our SEMP community will probably recall that uh, we are particularly interested in digging deep and questioning the foundations of science, mathematics, and philosophy in other particular fields, and hope that this uh, style of inquiry might lead to general insights that span uh, multiple disciplines. So today, our discussion will come from the intersection of a few fields, and we hope to dig deep and question a few assumptions that most of us might take for granted uh, with respect to plants and cognition. Um, we will be discussing some research on plant movement, the potential ability for certain plants to see, uh, and overall, in what way can we see plants as being cognitive systems and perhaps even sentient agents in their own right? Um, for the listeners and each of us here, most of us, uh, most of today will consist of in, an informal discussion between us. So with respect to the listeners, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and I'll try to bring them up when relevant, or join our Discord community for more discussion. Um, for all of us here, feel free to bring up any relevant thoughts. Uh, so besides the rough agenda, everything will be roughly preform. Um, so I believe the first thing on our uh, list is we'd like to talk about uh, one of the first papers, uh, and very recent one, uh, called the Dynamics of Plant Mutation. So uh, would I have of our guests like to take it from here, maybe explain what mutation is uh, for our audience, and then uh, give a summary of your paper? Yeah, mm, mutation or plant mutation is an oscillatory movement that many plants exhibit. Many plants that don't have a rigid uh, body uh, exhibit kind of a cycles, right? They, they, they grow up doing some form of a spiral, right? So that's a, that's a well-known a well -known, uh, movement, a well-studied one. Uh, there are fantastic works by Darwin uh, studying it so you know it's 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 a phenomenon that we kind of know but even Darwin himself thought that that movement could be adaptive right that 
plants could be using it to deal with their environment and to deal with the kind of things they wanted to. Uh, for, ist for instance, in the, in, in, in the case of this uh, paper, we, we were studying the plant notation, the, the movement of notation in uh, climbing beans. And we know that uh, climbing beans need to find a support uh, to climb after two or three weeks, you know, it 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 of course uh, depends on the on the on the particular uh, uh, genotype, you know. But after a few days, uh, the plant needs to find a support to twin around and to and to keep keep uh, going up, right? So, what we were thinking is that if the movement of, of nutation is adaptive or and the plant the the climbing being use the movement in order to find a support uh, to climb we should be able to find some of the signatures of goal directed uh, um, movement in the patterns of nutation right so that that's was that was our first idea there and then we work on 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 the behavioral uh, sciences, and we apply nonlinear methods, tool of from the cognitive sciences, to understand human uh, behavior. So, right. So we know that the patterns of behaviors that are goal directed in human beings, like walk into a place or you know balancing and that kind of stuff we know they have some particular signatures that for instance other kind of non-goal directed stuff like a uh, stone uh, falling doesn't exceed if you that is if you look to the time series of a uh, falling stone and to the time series of a uh, human being going somewhere there are signatures there that i mean we can talk about them but if you trust me so far there are signatures with respect to the complexity of those time series that allow us to differentiate between them so our idea was indeed very simple why don't we take these tools that we uh, use in the behavioral sciences and apply them to the time series of plant uh, notation and see what happens well what happens or what our study shows is that the time series of plant notation when there's a support uh, to climb in their environment uh, exhibit more more of these signatures than the time series without a uh, support uh, to climb in their environment so we can see them as if they were organizing their own behavior as to reach that uh, support so that's kind of the general idea of the paper so i i uh in reading your paper uh i particularly found uh it very interesting how um you were trying to propose a, a methodology um that would take us out of our uh, human-centric and uh, zoomorphic so animal uh, type of biases uh, that we would usually associate with behavior for uh, you know animals. But how how do we uh, figure that out for plants? Um, and uh, maybe you'd like to talk more about your uh, method methodology to free that uh, uh, bias from from the hypothesis testing. Yeah, I think that the, our paper is methodolic, methodologically uh, aimed, so to speak, in two ways. Um, the first one is, is the one way you say, right? Like we tried to, to use methods that don't really assume any form of brain uh, brain centrism or anthropocentrism, right? We don't we don't we 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 don't even talk about um, 
mental representations or any computation or internal uh, models, right? We go, we start from from a from a phenomenon that is uh, common to animals and plants is that they move around, right? Well, they move. Animals move around in the sense that they locomote, right? Uh, most plants don't, but they move, you know, they have organs that uh, move. And we think that's, that's a minimal assumption. And it's not even one uh, assumption, it's a fact that you can see them moving, right? It's not something that we have to, to think. So, so we, don't, we don't start from a, from a classical understanding of what the mind is, right? Of, you know, it's this thing that happens with, you know, that it happens within a brain or emerges from the, emerges from the activity of, of a brain and have internal models, representation and uh, motor commands. Uh, because this is, this is for, maybe for good historical reasons, this is a very, anthropocentric way of 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 uh, approaching the study of uh, minds right so our first step is to try to do to try to embrace a methodology that looks at simple behavior or simple uh, movement and try to understand the movement of, of, of plants from that point of view but the other methodological aim is to uh, provide the plant science sciences with a with a very general methodology to study plant movement. As I said, the 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 phenomenon of nutation is very well known. We have been it has been studied for centuries now, but most of the studies, for instance, are purely uh, kinematic, right? They are most uh, about general shapes, right? You know, circle, ellipses, angles, and that stuff. And, and we think that that's super cool, but there are other ways to, to study the movement that gives you a deeper understanding. And that's, you know, the study of the, of the, of the, of the time series and of the dynamical uh, properties right of the different trends they have uh, the, you know the the typical methodology that you use to study time series both in economics and in the behavioral sciences and in the uh, complex sciences we we don't see that in the plant sciences or uh, at least we don't see that in that region of the plant science sciences that try to study movement mm -hmm. right so our paper, I think, gives a very general methodology that can be applied to any time series, right? I mean, with, with some, uh, you know, uh, if they are long enough, et cetera. You know, they are, they're in, in, in data analysis, you always need something, some things there for the, for, for the, for the analysis uh, to work, right? But yeah, so it is methodological in that sense. In, in the, in the sense that we say, hey, look, plant physiologists that are interested in the movement of plants. Here you have a very easy method to implement and that may give you a different view on the movement of plants. And, you know, I don't think that means that, that, that they will give you a better understanding on whether plants are cognitive systems or not or a final word, you know, but it's a different way to look at mm, the movement and we can keep exploring, right? So uh, just to um, uh, inform the audience of uh, the nature of the, this experiment, um, yeah, and correct, feel, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, um, but so you had a plant in like this uh, chamber and you had a camera that's looking from the top view of the plant. Um, and you took a series of pictures uh, of that plant uh, as it uh, potentially moved. Um, and so what you're talking about with respect to the time series data is basically a series of pictures. Um, I think what, what would be interesting is maybe you can uh, talk about 
what specific uh, signatures within that, uh, that series of pictures you were looking at uh, and why you would pick these as potential uh, markers of you know, behavior. So yeah, uh, I think there's 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 one interesting thing about this um, particular experiment, and I'm going to brag a little bit. I think this is we have the the best experimental setup to study this. We 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 started doing this in 2015, and the and the data here is uh, I think was gathering late 2019. Uh, so we spent four years uh, refining the recording place, right? Uh, and by we, uh, I would say uh, mostly Paco Calvo, who was the one building that, and, and Roji Holgumi, who was a lab uh, member by that time, and she was actually the one that, that, that took the pictures, so to speak, right? So we had our experiment was is is ten pairs of plants in two identical recording booths. They are like I think one meter diameters cylindrical booths with a camera on top. We grow all the plants at the same time in the same place. We control for temperature, humidity, light, and that stuff. So we put two plants at the same time in the two different boots. The only difference between the two boots is that one of them has a support to play and the other one uh, doesn't have one, right? So, and, and, and then we have the, the two plants there uh, and we take a picture of them every minute. Um, the plants are in every boot usually two to three days and, and, and until one of them, the one that is in the boot with the support uh, to climb touches right or uh, and then we have a few thousands of uh, of uh, pictures of the of one booth and a few thousands of of the of the other booth and then we look for the for the coordinate of the position of the tip of mm, the plant in each picture and and those data points are the two time series, right? Right. And then when we have that, we look for the what we think are the typical signatures of uh, goal directed behavior. And why do we think these are the typical signatures of goal directed uh, behavior? Uh, because these are the signatures that we consistently find in goal directed behavior in in the behavioral uh, sciences we look for three of them there are others you know there are uh, different ways but we know that when behavior is goal directed like many of our own mm, behaviors it is usually the product of the non-linear organization of many components right and then you can explore for the non-linearity of the of the of the time series you know, of the outcome of that non-linear organization then we know that when our behavior is coupled or is goal directed to one aspect of our environment it becomes more uh, predictable with respect to that aspect right it, it, it's like um uh, our behavior carries information about uh, the goal right so the presence of that aspect makes uh, makes our behavior more more uh, predictable and the 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 more the stronger the coupling uh, between the behavior and the environment is, the more uh, complex it is. We see these three signatures in our goal-directed uh, behavior. When you see, you know, a baseball uh, player hitting a, a ball, or you know, in uh, grabbing a glass, or whatever thing. So we look for these three things: non-linearity, predictability, and complexity. And what 
we see is that the score of the time series of the plant that is in the booth with a support uh, to climb scores higher in these three things than the, than the time series of the plant that doesn't have any aspect of the environment to be coupled. Hey, Vicente, I have a question. So what, what do you mean by nonlinearity in this context? There, there are two things, right? Uh, the the nonlinearity of the organization of the of the components of mm, the system means that 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 the that the different parts relate to each other in a non-additive way, sure. right? Like 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 the like the same the same behavior of one part. Uh, is not always the same mm, depending on the on, on the on the relation with the other part so you can be doing uh, some some mm, movement with your arm right and if you look to the activation of the muscle here or mm, the muscle here might be the same one as in other uh, behavior right but as they don't add up the sum of all the of all the uh, of all the activities of each part doesn't always all come into the same thing, right? So it's kind of the, the, there's no uh, a proportional relationship mm -hmm. uh, between the activity of the parts and the outcome. So that's kind of the 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 the, the, the general view, right? That 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 the outcome of the whole system is not the mere uh, product of the sum of the activities of uh, all the parts, right? In that sense, a car is a linear thing, right? So, you know, all the activities will, will end up doing kind of the uh, same thing, but our organism organized in, in, in this non-linear way, but that's, as I said, the general concept there. In our measurement, how do we measure for 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 the non-linearity of that? Right? We don't we don't have a, an access to the to the to the to the to the organization of the system itself. At least in this uh, study, right? We we might have it in a different uh, setup, but we have the behavior, right? And we assume or you know or our hypothesis is if this behavior is the product of a non-linear organization in the way we say the outcome itself so the behavior itself has been non-linear in some way and then our mm, measurement of it is is actually super simple <laughs> super super simple it's like do we know linear oscillators? Yeah, right. You know the the it's is the is the is the easiest one, right? Okay, so we have an oscillation here, and the more the more different this oscillation is from a linear oscillator, the more the more non-linear our uh, system is, right? Mm -hmm. So we basically uh, compare our oscillatory uh, time series. Well, one aspect of it is called nor normal peak acceleration, which is blah blah blah. That, that, but that we uh, compare one aspect of our time series, which are oscillatory, with um, a standard uh, harmonic oscillator of the same amplitude, so to speak. And and if the more the more uh, different their ratio is from one, the more non-linear non, non it is, right? So so it's kind of an indirect uh, approach to the to the non-linear organization. So so what I what I found interesting uh, was you took a very like uh, behavioralist uh, type uh, framework. Uh, and that you're only like black boxing the organism and uh, trying to be, uh, you know, uh, one, of, one of the benefits of the, the black box mechanism is you're agnostic to any uh, preconceived biases about the internal 
things that are going in, in that box. Um, but uh, why, let's say, uh, what, I, I remember reading in the, in the paper, you, you, you said uh, that uh, you were uh, suggesting uh, a mechanism when you're uh, talking about the purely linear uh, oscillators perspective. You're saying that um, there might be a potential mechanism uh, uh, not merely influenced by these endogenous uh, factors uh, that might, uh, you know, prove to be a better candidate. Um, what perhaps mechanism, because uh, you're like making an inference about what's going on in the black box. Uh, do you have any like uh, proposed mechanism or like uh, favored one? Uh, it, it could be speculative, um, but yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a very important question. I think it is kind of it's it's somehow hidden in the paper uh, because we don't we we don't want to to pick many fights in just one paper. <laughs> so um, the thing is that both myself and Paula Silva and Paco approach cognitive science from a paradigm called ecological psychology which basically thinks uh, something like that the the unit of analysis for cognitive events is the animal and um, the animal environment or the in this case the organism environment system right so that that you are you are not going to be able to give a full description of a cognitive event just by looking at at the at the at the physiology so to speak so when we say maybe the mechanism is not only the endogenous activity we are literally saying that there are aspects of not only the uh, physiology but also the the general anatomy of the planet and the environment that features are as part of the mechanism so it's kind of a more extended one this doesn't mean uh, that we think uh, physiology plays no role, we do think so. We think uh, physiology is an important part and, and, and part of my other work when I work with uh, people instead of plants is trying to, uh, uh, to develop a, a understanding of our neurophysiology that is compatible with this, with this more ecological take, right? But when we say it's not only endogenous, we, we mean that whatever, whatever the mechanism is, we have to look at both, let's say, physiological and ecological uh, factors in, in, in there. So what's, what's the mechanism in plants? I don't really know. I, there are uh, different uh, proposals there. There are actually very recent papers, but, um, people doing engineering and psycho and biophysics that 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 are trying to approach it uh, bastian et al i think they are um there are interesting takes i i don't know i mean we kind of know some aspects of the of the of so to speak of the physiological mechanism of the mere movement right, right? We know that the bending in the nutation has to do with the differential growth of cells, right? So we know kind of this, 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 uh, this um, very basic details on how they just move, right? We don't really know what could be the mechanism for them to move in a goal-directed way. So, but I like to to invoke two old psychologists. One of them is uh, Tolman, who is one of the, pre the, the, the predecessor of the cognitive revolution. He says, in order for a physiology to explain a psychology, we first need a psychology to explain. And B.F. Skinner says, from a different camp, says something very similar, is that the best assignment physiologists can have is a good behavior, right? To, to explain. So I see this kind of the first step. We first really need to, uh, to understand the aspects of 
behavior deeply, and then we can see what kind of mechanism is able to uh, to do so. Instead of, for instance, say, okay, um, nutation is an elliptic thing. Let's explain it. No, I mean, let's explore what nutation. Let's go to to details there, and then we can know what 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 is the what are the physiological and ecological aspects of the of the mechanism. Yeah, so, so I, I find this interesting because it's almost as if your approach is uh, to uh, uh, prioritize uh, behavior as like a first class citizen. And uh, that behavior is in essence working, uh, working to map out like a fitness landscape. And you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, map as much of this out as you can before we can uh, explore the mechanisms behind what's shaping that. Uh, landscape. Um, and yeah, uh, I think we could also move on uh, to the next paper, uh, which touches a lot on this uh, uh, cognition uh, aspect. Um, I would like and... to, if it's possible, I would like to add something to what yeah, the sure. just said. Sure. So I think one of the, one of the, I'm answering your question, I don't think that, I think it's important to not uh, conflate behaviorism with behavior analysis. So I know that there are very similar concepts and it's, it's common in the, so I, I don't think, and Vicente is here so he can correct me, I don't think they adopt a behaviorist perspective because behaviorism is already a paradigm, a exploratory paradigm in, in uh, cognitive psychology or pre-cognitive psychology, even though it's, so what they, what they are trying to do is to offer a good behavior analysis of, uh, of mutation. And this is actually important because when you go to uh, the scientific literature of a plant, most papers are either physiology or kinematics. So behavior analysis don't almost, they're not there. But the question is, well, if, if we want to know if, if plants are uh, interesting subjects of a study for cognitive science, we need to start by behavior, behavior analysis. We need to know if the, if the way they move, the way they interact with the environments is complex enough to grant uh, uh, a discussion in terms of cognitive science. So in this sense, uh, uh, I, I think it's important. No, I don't think that they, they do I think it's very important is that, and it also connects with a question you asked at the beginning, you say, well, why did you pick uh, this uh, criteria of these markers? I think what they did, and again, uh, Vicente can, can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what they did is, okay, let's gonna take markers that are really well established in the literature about human beings, about anim non-human animals, and then see if those markers are also uh, found in plants. So instead of coming with their own markers and then jump into the discussion and say, well, I think we can find a very idiosyncratic markers of uh, plant uh, gold directed behavior, and then we will build our own science completely different from there. What they engage is, a, is in a comparative analysis. So, well, if those uh, markers are well established, are well recognized by you, all you behavior analysis when you speak about uh, human beings and non human animals, if I find those in plants, then by the same, the same token, you are forced to conclude with me that plant behavior is also goal oriented. And then the gate is open to uh, start the cognitive science analysis. So if the behavior is complex enough, then we can see if, <laughs> but, but what they did is not behaviorism, but behavior analysis, which is the beginning, in my opinion, of uh, a well, a well done cognitive science. <laughs> I don't know if, if Vicente agree with, agrees with that. I do. <laughs> so Mandy, uh, before we move on to the next, to the next uh, subject, uh, I perhaps can uh, wear my physicist hat here and make a final point about the experiment because I, I remember reading a paper when it came out. Uh, Paco sent it to me, and uh, and he showed me the videos as well, like the the time series and everything. Um, so you know, from from a point of view of purely sort of the information that is that is flowing in that chamber where, where the plant is, is moving, I was very curious to ask. You know, um, is this support? So if I understand correctly, the support is some plastic, some very neutral, chemically neutral. Uh, Thing, right this is just a piece of material I mean you can you can give me the specifics uh, but as far as I could understand um, I was trying to sort of trim down what kind of information flows from from the from the support to the plant purely from a physics point of view right like what, what kind of uh, possible um, mediator there is I mean obviously there's air in the room there is obviously light uh, in the room um, so what, what 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 is the what is this angle uh, for, for the for the for the question? We try to not to say anything yeah. again uh, because we, we I think we pick a fight big enough. Yes, yes. But if you ask me yeah. my opinion, 
and I think this relates well with with the topic now. I think it's there are good re uh, 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 at least it's not impossible to think that it's optical. Uh, it's light uh, because yes, the pole is very neutral in itself, right? Um, also, uh, the I would say that the directionality of a chemical, the the uh, the fusion, if it were the case, is not very clear, you know, and. Actually, if you think about it, the plant doesn't need to, if it is optical, hmm. the plant doesn't need a, a, a very intricate uh, system there. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a very clear environment in the structure of light that tells you that you are approaching to something, hmm. which is what the plant needs, right? And, yeah. and, and, and it's that the, that, the, that the texture there expands right everything when you go there expands in your in your in your uh, visual feeling uh, uh, contracts when you go back right and to do so you actually only need a very you know very small uh, ca uh, camera obscura you know mm, it's yeah. it's it's not it's not a very intricate thing you 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 don't need the plan to be categorizing the pole there there yeah, just yeah. need to be some structure there that expands as the plan uh, goes uh, round and round, right? And and that's it. So I think optical mm -hmm. is the bed, or at least it's the bed I want to explore more. And I guess there are different ways in which we can think of experiments in which we can trick the optics there and see and see if we trick the the movement itself. Uh, Miguel, what do you think? Well, I, don't, I mean, I, as, as Vicente said, I, I come from the same background as them, so I also come from a uh, ecological psychology background. So it, it's, I agree with him. I mean, if, if you understand perception in the Gibsonian sense and just for the control of action, uh, from a physiological point of view, it doesn't seem very demanding. And the possibility of having some sort of proto vision or proto perception for action is not really that crazy in my in my opinion. I know that uh, some people were playing around with the possibility of echolocation as well. I don't know what happened about that. I'm not sure. I, I knew about that years ago, but I, I maybe Vicente knows if this um, experiment has still been conducted or not. So do you know about that? The, the possibility of echolocation that also seems to be a relatively simple, from a physiological point of view, um, navigating system. I don't know if you... I... I do remember, I don't even know if this got published or if this went very, very, very far away, you know, because you are in contact with people in different labs and you know that they are doing things, but I don't really yeah. remember. I do, I do remember a kind of experimental setup. And again, if, if, if this have been, have been published, I apologize, I don't really remember now, but I do remember that a way to test Echolocation against optics is instead of having a pole, is to, for instance, have have a, a, a white screen with with a, a light, with a with a, a line yeah. with a black line painted, there, right? So still, when you approach that line, it expands, but but now there's no structure where where you can Sound find the, 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 the difference you need for echolocation. So I do remember that as something that at least someone was thinking about. <laughs> I don't really remember if, 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 it, got, if it got published or, or, or if it was successful. Yeah, but, I, haven't, I haven't seen anything either. I don't know, yeah. But, but, but that's, a, but that's a, a good example, at least of the kind of experimental setups you can think of in, 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 to, to try to discriminate uh, between these hypotheses. Purely again, purely from the physics point of view, echolocation sounds very uh, far-fetched in that context, right? Because I mean, the kind of uh, orders of magnitude of, of uh, vibrations that would need to be detected seem very implausible in the real world, especially where this is. If this adaptive behavior is to play any role, if you have any breeze, I think that I mean, it's going to be very hard to explain, right? So, but no, I, I, that that's exactly the kind of answer I wanted because I was very curious what, what your thoughts were in the present day about about this this point. 
Well, I, I think uh, it is. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm uh, partial to the light as well. But I think uh, there was some uh, recent stuff in neuroscience where they were uh, positing that uh, communication within the brain could be uh, mechanically based. Uh, and I mean, that, that would uh, lend credence to the, the opposite school, which would be uh, the vibration uh, sound aspect. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a, I don't know if that's the paper you are, you are talking about, but there's this very recent paper talking about the synapses that, that actually push others, right? And, and it's, it's literally mechanical, right? Not uh, a pushing thing, yeah, interesting. I mean, just to clarify that I meant that the, the echolocation would have to happen between the plant and the pole, right? So, so not, not within the plant itself in, in the sense that obviously, I mean, I think there is even some evidence about um, sort of uh, noise detection or vibration detection, sort of more mechanical detection of the body plant itself. But what I mean is that th there should be some kind of transfer of information between the pole and the, and the, and the actual plant itself. And it sounds like it should be through the air. And that feels very, I mean, the, the physics doesn't really work out in my opinion. Well, no, I don't know what you mean uh, uh, by uh, information transmission, but I mean, I mean, echolocation exists in, in nature yeah. in, in different animals. So I don't know. Sure. I, I'm curious. That was so the, the, the reason why I mentioned echolocation is because I remember the same conversation with Vicente, I, I guess it was years ago, when mm, uh, they were thinking about this experiment and they were, they were this debating about that and mentioned, oh, someone is trying to uh, test this hypothesis. But I'm not sure why you think is that um, is way more complex than than the visual or protovisual hypothesis. So I'm curious about. No, no, I, I was I was just uh, so sorry. So I should clarify that if echolocation means that the plant is emitting somehow so, sort of a sonar mechanism, like like in other animals that have echolocation, that that's certainly a possibility. That that that's that I was not saying that that was any more complicated or potentially complex. But I was just I was just referring that. If the if the if the plant is somehow perceiving from in a more passive manner, sort of the simply the 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 position out of uh, out of mere vibrations or somehow indirectly instead of an active echolocation, that's what I meant. That that any I mean the order of magnitude of of, of the of the mechanics there, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna work out. But yeah, yeah, I mean in, in, in no, that sense, that's right. But but uh, I'm happy that you mentioned that because actually one of the uh, one of the um, another crucial idea in ecological psychology, which is, again, the, th the theory that Vicente and I favor because of our, uh, mostly because of our background, is the, that we challenge the idea that perception is that passive. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Vicente's experiment, in a way, already shows that, I mean, the way the, the, you see this dynamic complexity in the nutation is because the, the, the plant is coordinating the behavior with the, maybe with the expansion of, assuming it's, it's visual, right? So there's actually a, an action uh, on the side of the plant that is uh, directed to exploit some information, to generate some information in the environment. So it's, it's not, yeah, if you understand perception in a pure basic, basic way, then probably you're gonna have a problem. However, if you go to uh, nature and you, especially in, in animals, you see that perception is never that passive. I mean, animals usually move to amplify information. So I don't, th I don't see why this hypothesis should be uh, ruled out uh, for plants in the beginning. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I think the echolocation and, and optic, I think they're, they, they're equally, apply equally, I think, in this, in this context. It's just that, as, as you say, I think the, the optic one seems to be more physically sound in this particular context. Uh, I think, I think uh, to touch upon this topic and to like rearrange uh, what's, what's on our agenda, since we're talking about optic stuff already, uh, maybe we can uh, talk about the, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Oquila trifolia lata. Uh, I, I believe there is uh, some recent stuff uh, proposing that uh, perhaps this plant uh, has primitive uh, eye-like uh, structures. Um, so maybe one of you uh, can explain why, uh, like why, why this plant is important. Why do we think uh, it might show behavior in response to uh, light and s stuff like that? I've been talking a lot, so Miguel, go ahead. Very briefly, I mean, I'm sure you know, you know the paper. Um, well, basically, the, uh, this paper comes uh, from a previous discovery, like years ago, by Carrasco Ura and someone else. So basically, they, they found out in a plant that is native from Chile, the Boquilla trifoliata, that uh, the plant shows a very uh, complex and flexible um, leaf mimicking system. So the, the, basically, the plant adopts 
the the shape of the of the of the uh, leaves of the hosts, and if the plant, for example, is uh, being hosted by different plants, it will adopt the shape of the different plants it's being hosted. So you can see even up to two or three different uh, uh, shapes with the same individual of Bogilotti foliata. In basically the the most uh, accepted hypothesis were for that was either uh, some kind of uh, chemical volatiles that the plant could detect or some kind of, um, uh, genetic transmission through microbes and things like that. This paper is interesting because they try to say, okay, what happened if, what would happen if we, uh, instead of using a, a real plant or organic plant as a host, we use a plastic uh, vine, I think it is, right? Good, our Bokila de uh, adopt the, <laughs> the shape of the leaves. And they discovered that uh, there is a, a, a great, a, a, an important uh, amount of uh, mimicking there, but then obviously this plant cannot doesn't have. Uh, it's impossible to have a genetic transmission. It's impossible to have uh, chemical volatiles. So it seems that the only option, the only, uh, and this is an inference to the best explanation, or even an inference to the only explanation so far, is well, it must be some kind of visions. You can see some some um, mm. uh, shape discrimination, because. <laughs> so I think this 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 experiment is one of the uh, first one, if I'm not mistaken, that test the hypothesis of plant vision in a in a in an important way so like rolling out all other possibilities so i think this this is one of the most interesting papers i've i've read in the last years about that yeah so i don't know if Vicente wants to add something about that i'm 100 agree with what miguel has said So uh, I, I know uh, some some criticism about it was that uh, uh, criticism was with respect to the uh, experimental methodology. Uh, methodology. Um, how uh, I, either of you can answer this? How likely do you think uh, that criticism like uh, is uh, valid? Um, as well as uh, would you like to like propose any mechanisms uh, that could be light based but are not uh, these primitive oscillate? Uh, eye structures? Um, I do think there's, there, there has been issues on the experimental methodology of the behavioral approaches to plants. And that's why I'm, I'm proud of our paper, uh, because I think our recording booths and that kind of stuff uh, up, update the, the standards, right? You see, for instance, you see papers on notation two in which they put a plan there and they have the plan under 24 hours light. And then they see spooky things, of course. I mean, plants uh, are very sensitive uh, to light. They have their own circadian rhythms, right? And if you put them in, a, in, an, in, a, in an environment with 24 hours of light every day, I instead of a proper light uh, cycle, you might find something weird, right? You might find the plant exhausted. Imagine if they put us in, a, in, a, in, 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 an, in, a, in an environment, right? So I would say that, that, that I don't know about this particular experiment on, I don't know to what extent the methodological um, skepticism with, with regards to this particular experiment is, is going to be very challenging or not. I do know that that we need to 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 improve our standards, and I think we are, we are trying to do that. And then there's there's a whole discussion here, um, which I think is also part of a topic we will talk to, which is about what counts like vision, right? Um, is whatever the plan is. Is doing is doing here, and even accepting that it's uh, some form of optical mechanism or light-based mechanism. Can we be talking about vision? Well, it depends on what you take. I would say that the that historically speaking, in the in the cognitive sciences, and actually I've, I, 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 I have some some recent conversation with the vision ecologists about this. The key to move from, let's say, photosensitivity to vision 
it's uh, space, mm. you know, it's it's spatial relationships to be able to present. And this is kind of the oldest puzzle, right? The, it's in in Descartes, it's in Al Hassan, you know, it's it's the oldest uh, puzzle for the vision sciences is likely how the hell are we able to to perceive distance right and to and to, and to perceive. so it is possible that the boquilla uh, the boquilla trifoliolata is able to mimic without vision right it is possible that there's something there well mimicry at the end is a form of uh, categorization so to speak right you you identify something and actually if you if you read the the machine learning literature on vision nowadays it seems vision is all about categorization i i think that's an issue in itself and, and i can rant about it if you want to but that's another thing <laughs> but in this case it it is it is thinkable that we can or that organisms are able to categorize without vision right the simplest thing is that an organism is able to different wavelengths that we call uh, colors right and you can do that with a photosensitive mechanism that is not vision itself right it's it's, it's, it's just the photosensitivity to this very basic aspect of the of the of the light in in in, in this uh, environment right if the boquilla is doing something similar to a categorization of the shape of leaves are are these uh, properties as simple as being able to be carried out by just a photosensitive mechanism and not vision and not the vision uh, proper i think that that it is possible and and some of the vision ecologists i've, I've been talking to think it might be possible you know there are some ways in which it could be done and also you know assuming that the the mimicry you see is more of a tendency that you know that than a perfect uh, thing like like it would be so yeah we are we are in very early first steps on this but it is possible that this is just photosensitivity and mm, not visual and of course photosensitivity in plants is not mysterious at all, right? If, if they do something, is to grow and to and to feel light, right? Yeah, so, so just to add to what Vicente said, I, I mean, I think I think he's kind of percent right that we are in very early stages to be able to propose any uh, candidate for a mechanism for this. It's, it's, it's very difficult. But I think the paper is interesting in the sense that is kind of the first stepping stone to uh, rule out, again, with all the scare quotes that you want, because probably they are, I, I don't know, I don't know the, the specific uh, methodological criticism to this paper. I haven't been uh, following the discussion about this paper in, in particular, but it seems that the two most accepted hypotheses, uh, chemical transmission, um, uh, genetic transmission and chemical volatiles, are ruled out by the own experimental setup. So therefore, we need to find something else. Maybe it's uh, photosensitivity. Maybe it's some sort of visual categorization that is more complex than photosensitivity. We don't. I think it's impossible to tell yet. Also, probably this this experiment needs to be properly replicated. And I mean, another problem we, we see in 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 plant cognition, especially in papers about plant behavior, one of Vicente mentioned there are many problems. One of them is, is the lack of replication. I mean, most papers are not <laughs> replicated yet because they are very, very uh, new. So, I mean, we're still, this science is very, very, very uh, in a nascent stage. So it's very, it's very early to just make wild bets on, on what would cause this, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I, I find this uh, plant uh, pretty cool uh, ever since I heard about it. Uh, and I've, I've been wanting to propagate my own um but uh it it's interesting because like the the leaf uh structure itself is almost like uh like a primitive form of memory it's a state that uh can be uh, examined uh externally by uh, us and whether you call that you know memory or not uh 
it's uh, something that uh, records uh, something. And um, yeah, I'd just be interested if uh, any of you guys would be uh, willing to study this in the future uh, uh, with respect to more complicated um, uh, experimental setups, uh, you know, altering the geometry of light, polarization, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So, um, I know uh, we have uh, for the last two years or so, even a little bit more, we had uh, seeds of uh, Bokila Triculiolata in the mean lab. Uh, as far as we know, I haven't talked uh, to Paco in, the, in about this in the last uh, a few months, but we were having troubles to make it grow. Um, to make it, you know, to make it germinate and, and, and be viable subjects. I know we, we, uh, we were, at least uh, until a few months ago, we were working on that, or the lab was working on that. Um, and I know that we, that we were thinking about doing something uh, with uh, the plants, right? But so far, it's... Uh, it's a problem of we not be be good enough as to make them grow in the in the proper way. So, Mandy, how? Guess, yes, oh, please, Miguel, go ahead. No, no, coming to what well, question Mandy uh, asked. So, one one interesting, I think, one interesting way to to uh, expand this experiment would be to add some um, contextual elements here. So, for example, in my so there's one. Uh, I probably isn't to remember. So the, in the first paper on um, uh, habituation, learning by habituation by Monica. So one thing that they found out that I think that not many people really uh, picked up so well is that uh, actually the uh, habituated reflex is context dependent. So for example, in uh, conditions where light is scarce, so in conditions where uh, folding the leaves is actually costly in terms of <laughs> uh, light foraging, uh, you see that plans so the the reflex takes longer to 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 appear so one interesting way once the the experiment is replicated would be to see, to see that okay if we fa if we uh, have reason to think that different uh, uh, shapes leaf shapes uh, create differences for example in the capacity of plant for for its for light then one interesting uh, side experiment would be say okay is is this uh, mimic mimicry mechanism sensitive to contextual issues or not, because that then it gives you again another element to uh, start thinking in, of plants in cognitive ways. So it's not just a reactive mechanism. So it's, it's a mechanism that is contextual that shows some um, sensitivity to trade-offs in the environment. And this this could be a way to to expand the the, the experiment and make it more into the interesting from a uh, cognitive science cognitive science perspective, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think the context one is, is a very important uh, perspective, as well as if there's like uh, something temporally context as well. Uh, like if uh, you exhibit like uh, higher variance at some stage and it changes behavior at uh, time x plus uh, one or whatever, uh, and that uh, you know could be a form of like uh, predictive processing almost. Um, yeah, but Carlos, you're you're gonna say something. No, I was just going to suggest that uh, unless we want to add something else at this point, we can take a break, a brief break, and then come back with uh, the other list of topics. All right, so if everyone's happy with that, uh, we'll pause for about five minutes and we'll be right back. Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research, SEMF from its original Spanish acronym, is created in response to the current scientific, social and technological environment. Despite the fast communications and interconnectivity of the information age, most branches of knowledge are still largely segregated, and institutions dedicated to their advancement tend to be managerially complex, often constrained by their history and rarely in substantial cooperation with each other. This contrasts with recent developments, showing that today's frontiers of human understanding often lie outside the bounds of traditional disciplines. SEMF aims to address fundamental questions with rigour and honesty, always striving to consider them broadly, profoundly and contextually. 
We believe that this type of intellectual endeavour is most likely to flourish in dynamic environments that foster the creative exploration of ideas and the organic growth of research projects and collaborations. SEMP aspires to provide such an environment by keeping things simple, staying managerially lightweight and being run by a team of active researchers and intellectuals. At SEMF, we promote rationality and scientific thinking across all human inquiry, since we consider these to be the best tools for development of civilization and the understanding of the universe we all inhabit. Our universalist approach to human knowledge helps us bridge the gap between traditionally disjointed disciplines, particularly the familiar yet limiting divide between the sciences and humanities. This mindset allows us to identify deep themes across diverse topics, a powerful asset when trying to unify separate areas of research. Ultimately, SEMF aims to establish a pluralistic community of scientists, creatives, academics, artists, students, intellectuals, and generally enthusiasts united under the common goal of delving deeper into fundamental questions. In principle, all topics are welcome under the SEMF dome. However, given its fundamental nature, subjects such as linguistics, physics, cognitive science, mathematics, complexity science, philosophy, biology or computer science are well represented in our events and activities. To accomplish our goals, we currently do three things. We ideate and organise transdisciplinary conferences and seminars. We host the Semp Queer podcast, where small groups of experts with different backgrounds come together to discuss a transversal topic. And we maintain the Agora, a platform implemented on Discord and Telegram where our members can self-organise and participate in talks, debates, study groups and social gatherings. All the information about SEMF can be found on our website, www.semf.org.es. There you can also become a member in a couple of clicks. In our YouTube channel, you can find our live streams and podcast recordings. And follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with all our events and announcements and find us on most other social media platforms.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are back from the break. And now we're going to move on to a uh, second set of questions. So Mandy, it's my co-host here, is going to lead us to that. So please take it away. Okay, uh, so I think next I'd like to tackle uh, this somewhat uh, simplistic uh, question of whether or not uh, plants form representations uh, of their environment. So I know uh, some philosophers and cognitive scientists like to talk about this 4E uh, approach to cognition, uh, which argues that cognition does not necessarily uh, occur solely in the head, but uh, is also embodied embedded, enacted, and extended um, by way of some processes and, and structures outside of the head. Um, so there was this 2017 paper uh, in uh, animal cognition uh, that even argued that spiders might potentially outsource their information processing capabilities uh, that you would normally expect to occur within the central nervous system uh, to perhaps their body or environment like the web itself. Uh, so in essence, their web uh, functions as like a working component of their cognitive processing ability, like an exocortex almost. Uh, so using this analogy, uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, in what, in what sense uh, do plants uh, either, so this is not necessarily mutually exclusive, but do they uh, form representations of the environment that are physically instantiated within their uh, anatomical, um, you know, uh, like their body or do they perhaps offload uh, some of the cognitive processing and computational abilities uh, to their external environment, like uh, maybe uh, the geometry or the constraints or shaping future affordances, um, et cetera. So uh, I, you know, I, I'd like to hear from either of you uh, on your thoughts of uh, what plants might be doing like with respect to cognitive processing and where. Yeah. So. Let me start because I can answer this question in either 30 seconds or six months and I'm going to do the 30 seconds part and also because oh, Miguel works more about mental representations than I do. I, I think that plants doesn't form any representation. I don't think any organism forms any mental representation. I think the notion of mental representation is an ill post notion for an ill post issue. Uh, if if you if you are if you situate yourself, for instance, in the mainstream mainstream of uh, cognitive science, when you think mental representations, computation, and, the, and you look to your left, you see the extended mind people that are those that think that there are uh, computations that happens also with outside, and then you see an activists, and then you, you see the four E people. And then you see ecological psychologists. I'm in that camp, <laughs> that far away, right? So, so I think, I mean, just to finish this, and, and Miguel can elaborate as much as he can. I think that there are, of course, correlations between physiological states and environmental states. I think they don't they don't uh, constitute. Our representation in any meaningful way and I think that you don't need organisms outsourcing any abilities uh, because again as we point out we pointed out at the beginning the organism environment system is the cognitive unit itself so there's not something in, inside that you put outside the outside is always there from the very beginning. So that's it. No mental representation for anybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Miguel? Yeah, so, so, yes, I think I have to elaborate. No, I, I'm, in a sense, I, 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 I mean, I, I agree with Vicente. So one of, the, one of the problems of this conversation, I think, is that we agree. I mean, we have been friends and we have been discussing about these topics for ages. So it's kind of difficult that uh, we are going to disagree. But elaborating your question, I think, so the more I think about that, the more I think that the question, do plants, do organism X form mental representations, is just impossible to answer. And the reason why it's impossible to answer is because even though, and it's actually quite paradoxical, at least interesting from a sociological point of view. I mean, considering how relevant and how widely used the notion of representation is in the cognitive sciences, it's almost impossible to believe how poorly defined the notion is. 
So the more you read about mental representations, the more you see that this notion is not univocal in any possible way. So you, if you go to cognitive neurosciences, most of the most of the cognitive neuroscientists speak about neuro, uh, mental representations with or, or representations at least with no problem. But then when you ask them, say, yeah, I mean, is this a neural network that activates in this activity? And then you speak with classical computation, and they will uh, tell you that mental representations are symbolic structures that are somehow instantiated in the nervous system or most uh, precisely in the brain, and that they have somehow, only God knows how, uh, semantic properties. And then you go to connectionists, and then you go, and in the end is that the question, do organized X have mental representation is impossible to answer unless you tell me what you understand by mental representation, and then you make the notion operative enough to be tested in the lab and to be, Otherwise, impossible. So this is this, is, and then also agreeing with this center. My my point is that the more you push the notion of mental representation, you see that, and, and the more problems you bring in, uh, the more philosophical and theoretical and empirical puzzles you bring in, the more you see that defenders of representations uh, keep deflating the notion to the point that it's not meaningful anymore anymore. So in the end, most of the most of the time, you see people say, yeah, mental representation is some uh, a causal mediator that is internal to the organism. Okay, but if this is their notion, then any physical system in the world is gonna have representations. Therefore, the notion becomes explanatory irrelevant from my point of view. So I, I, unless you give me a solid notion and an operative way, so a, a, a way to make it operative, then the notion is, is, is and, and the question is impossible to, to answer. That's, that's my perspective. And then about the cognitive of loading, I think, and also uh, is with Vicente, uh, the, the notion of cognitive of, the cognitive of loading, I think uh, comes from the wrong metaphor about cognition. It's the idea that cognition is internal, and then sometimes some organisms are able to uh, outsource, to externalize what they are doing. So it's the example of uh, Otto and Inga with the, with the, um, sorry, the classic uh, paper about the extended mind. So this, this uh, I think Otto, Otto is a um, patient of uh, Alzheimer's disease, and then uses a, a, a book note uh, uh, notebook, sorry, to just find its way to his way to the museum, and then say, well, w memory, which is internal in this specific example, is being outsourced to the notebook. But again, this comes from a, from the wrong metaphor. So it comes from the idea that cognition is inside, and sometimes under some very specific cognition is brought outside for some specific needs. However, if you face cognition from a task specific way, so okay, what is uh, what is Otto trying to do? Remember where the where the uh, museum is. Okay, what are the elements that Otto has <laughs> to do this task? The notebook. So the notebook is a causally relevant part of the process that makes Otto remember where the museum is. There is no offloading because cognition is not somewhere. So cognition is the process, it's, it's the, the, the ability that you have. And, and I think this idea actually comes from ecological psychology. I mean, if you take ecological psychology seriously, so if you take the, the, the seriously the idea that the minimum unit of analysis is the organism environment system, and if you take a task-oriented approach, then it's no cognitive of loading. <laughs> it's just uh, uh, um, ex extensive, if you want, so processes that are that the organism brings about to solve the problem. But it's, it's not just internal and then sometimes external. So taking uh, perhaps uh, some of the information processing uh, stuff that Carlos was mentioning uh, a lot earlier in this uh, discussion, uh, let's say we were just to talk about um, where most of the computation uh, would be happening, uh, for instance, uh, or, or where would the, the complexity of that computation uh, be instantiated? Um, would that be a potentially uh, viable uh, operational uh, definition? And if so, uh, where do you think the, uh, that would be occurring in plants or in the environment around plants or whatever uh, else? I think there's a, there's a similar issue with the notion of uh, computation itself. If you see how it was used at the beginning of the cognitive revolution, the, the 60s, the 70s, and even for, by some people now, the idea that, the, that the, the brain mind is a computer was quite literal, right? You know, it's a system that has an input that encodes that that manipulates whatever has been encoded there and then decodes and this actually happens at, 
a different scale. So it's not just the whole brain that encodes and, 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 and decodes, but the retina encodes for the region V1 that then goes down or up, you know, the ventral or the, or the dorsal path, where there's a different decoder that re-encodes and sends it to a different place, right? So, um, but then there's, I mean, I think that view has many, many problems and to me, it's as, as, as you can find the same flaws as you find with the idea of representation. Nobody knows where the codes, the code comes from. It has to be very, you have to imagine a very well-defined restricted input to have a, an efficient code, right? While the relationship says by the, by the, environment and the light that gets to our retina is a highly nonlinear uh, function likely irreversible right so so the so the problem that the brain seems to need to solve which is is to take that input and to reverse mm, the model uh, to go to the cause seems intractable uh, you know, you know there, are, there are many issues there. So the, I could say that a thick notion of computation like this one is 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 not viable for for uh, for for the understanding of the way organisms deal with their environment in a cognitive sense. So if that's the notion of uh, computation we are thinking about there's no computation anywhere. Like, like I think there's no representation anywhere. If the notion of representation is that thick one with truth values, with meaning, with uh, semantics. There's also a different notion of uh, computation of first representation that Miguel has uh, pointed out that it, if you talk to cognitive neuroscientists is basically activation, correlation. And you know, and that you can call that representation, or you can call that however you want, right? So that's okay. In computational neuroscience, though, they have a notion of representation in deep neural networks and in, in, in encoders, how to encoders that is slightly different too. But that's a different thing, right? But also, if some people think that yes, the brain mind is a computer, in so far as it can be. Mm, describe as a as a Turing um, machine that solve this kind of of issues. You know, implements a function that can be solved algorithmically in a finite set of st steps. Right? If that's the notion of computation at play, I'm cool with that uh, because, as many people say, a glass of water in uh, of the sun, as it evaporates is a computer too, right? You, you, you can describe that. So assume that this is the notion of uh, computation that we, that we are dealing with, which means that this organism is able to instantiate this uh, function here, which is approaching to a pole or uh, to mimic there. I would say that then the computation is going to be distributed in the system. It points out again to uh, to some of the first topics we were talking about. You know, there are going to be some physiological substratum the organism needs, and not only that. You know, very very basic anatomical one. The 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 shoots of the plant has to be able to bend. Uh, uh, physically speaking, there has to be some form of elasticity there, right? And that's part of it. And there has to be differential growth too, right? There has to be probably some some long range electrical communication in uh, the plant of some sense. And there there has to be a proper environment at place too. There has to be light. There has to be, you know, uh, and you know, if in a very deflated way, the computation uh, to me would be 
uh, in the in, in at different scales of the organism and environment system in a in a thicker way of you know an encoding system that manipulates but i don't think there's any computation ever yeah so, you, so elaborating what this said so um, for example there's um, yes if, if you want to like uh, dig in this problem so there's there's one philosopher that i really like because he's um, he's a defender of representations but he's also in very honest in a way that he makes a very substantive analysis and then reach the conclusion that most of the times when philosophers and scientists use the notion of representation where they're meaning something that is not a representation in any uh, meaningful significant ways is Bill Ramsey so he has his, this book in 2007 called representation reconsidered and also he published a paper uh, in 2017 called it's a question mass cognition be, be representational and basically what he says is that yeah I'm I'm defender of some sort of representations I think they are useful I think they are um, empirically um, verifiable, but most philosophers and current sciences assume that representation is a, is a definitional criteria and then make the fallacy of conflating this planet and this planet. But they say, well, if it's, if it's cognitive, then it's representation. And then they basically rule out all other possibilities. And then if you end up saying, well, plants are, don't have representations, and then the argument is, well, then plants are not, are not cognitive. But then, well, but I just show you that plants' behavior is sophisticated enough, is, is flexible enough, is complex enough. So basically, what they they end up ruling out empirical possibilities on the basis of armchair, um, armchair a priori reasoning. So this this is a, what a, one problem uh, with the debate of representations. It's poor, it's very poorly defined, and it's most of the time used as a definitional assumption, and never as a as an empirical hypothesis. And then also coming to the to the question about elaborating on the on the um, distribution of computation understood in this uh, loose deflationary way, there's. This idea of computation being um, distributed, it's, it's very old. I mean, there's a famous paper by Barbara Webb in the 90s when the CDC was trying to investigate uh, cricket, cricket uh, phonotaxis, so the ability of a female cricket to track uh, the location of male cricket and to uh, pick the most suitable uh, mate to breed with. And then basically, she, so she was trying, as any other robotic, roboticist, with, okay, we, we have to, to increase the computational power of the of the robot cricket in the traditional way, but then she turned she turned a different approach. So why why don't we pay attention to the physical morphology of the of the body of the cricket and what the crickets do? And then she found out that you can actually replicate cricket phonotax uh, uh, phonotaxis if you pay attention to the structure of the acoustic spiracles. If you re so the thing is uh, one of the principles of embodied cognition and ecological psychology is that. Uh, most of what you think is internal, brain-based and neuro, ne based on, on neural computation, is actually uh, based on your own action in the environment. So you act in the environment to solve problems. The same way Vicente was mentioning. So one of the issues is, is uh, space perception, is, is uh, perception of depth. Well, you can take a, a classical approach and then assume that you compute uh, retinal pictures, 2D and then 3D with somehow you do or you move to produce motion parallax, and then you see that there are some objects that are closer to you than the other. This seems like a very easy way to, to know if the bottle that I have in front of me is closer to me than the, than the pile of paper. And in fact, it makes sense to think that in nature, this is what animals do. They move to produce motion parallax to know what is closer instead of, uh, but for some reason, and we just, for uh, historical reasons, we assume that, no, that vision or cognition is something uh, based on brain. And then we come up with all kind of incredibly difficult theories that don't resemble what, uh, what um, organisms do. And then coming to the question of plants. I mean, we know that plants have um, an internal uh, signaling communication system that has a, a variation potential and action potentials, also like some uh, neurotransmitters that we find in in animals, so it's reasonable to think that this internal internal uh, signaling system is going to play a role in the ability of plants to uh, interact with the environment in flexible and complex way. What we don't buy is that this is all the story. But you can tell the whole story about uh, climbing beans just paying attention to electrical transmission in, inside the plant. So you probably you will need something else. You will need also like if there's a camera scura or. So you will need something that is extended. And it, again, it makes sense. From an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense that we have evolved mechanisms that make cognition or the capacity to, to solve cognitive tasks 
based on uh, embodied uh, physical properties instead of uh, neural tissue, which is very expensive from a metabolic perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. Uh, I, I think a lot of computation uh, is embedded uh, within the geometry uh, of the organism itself uh, and the mechanical properties, uh, as well as uh, a more abstract uh, topology of all the relationships uh, it has with its environment. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I've always been uh, pretty partial to that uh, perspective. Uh, maybe Carlos would uh, like to... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, sort of bring in a, a different angle because I find this this topic quite interesting. So I wouldn't mind to sort of like spend longer time just going around this question of representations, especially computation. I think I'm more interested in in this notion of computation, uh, where computation happens, what is computation, all these kinds of things, particularly for the uh, question of, of plants and and animals. Um, I think it's, I mean, from from a from a physical point of view, I think living matter is clearly doing something that is that is so easy to explain in the same way that we can explain other kinds of matter, right? Like there is, there is clearly something going on um, in, in, in living matter, generally living matter, but also, also matter that is attached to, uh, to living matter in some way, like technology and things like that, um, that is doing something that it's from a, from a purely uh, model descriptor, uh, model prediction point of view is very hard to, is very hard to, to describe. I mean, and, and this is all the, all this conversation, all the complexities involved in cognitive science and all, all these debates that we're having, I mean, are kind of representative of that. And the, the reason why we have these beautiful theories, fundamental physics that can predict some aspects of nature in extreme accuracy, while things that are completely uh, mundane still remain mysterious and, and tractable, right? I mean, th th there, is, there is something, uh, I think it's, in my opinion, is sort of part of, of, of the game of the universe that is just the, the way it is, that, 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 that they are different. And so every time I think about computation and every time I, I, I hear the word representation being mentioned, because I don't really use it that much myself or I don't, I mean, I'm not a cognitive scientist, I'm not in these debates normally, but um, I'm mostly thinking in terms of um, the efficiency of, of model uh, and, 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 the predictable, and the predictive power of models, right? So when, when uh, one looks at, uh, for example, cellular biology, it's easy, I mean, you can just get completely lost in the complexity of biochemistry and the you know order of magnitude of, of the processes going on. But if you learn about genetics, about the genetic code, about all these sort of computer-like mechanisms that are going on, um, I think that they offer sort of this angle of approach where suddenly you can reduce a lot of the complexity and, and boil it down to something that looks like computation. And I think that a lot of people took it way too seriously and said, yeah, actually the brain is a computer or is doing computation. I think that's taking it too far. But I think at, at some level of description, there is something that is completely indistinguishable from any other kind of model that we will use. Because obviously, if, for example, in your nutation experiment, you're measuring the tip of the, of the plant as, as coordinates, for example, you're giving some pair of numerical values, for example, to the tip of the uh, the, the tip of the of the plant. Um, at the end of the day, you're gonna process that data somehow. I mean, these are some numerical variables. You're gonna process it somehow, and you're gonna come to some conclusions that are gonna have symbolic form, either in mathematics or in in, in verbal language or something like that. And I think that that sort of process is inescapable. I mean, we're all scientists here, so we know that the, that that should be the process. We should communicate it. We should be reproducible and so on. Um, and I think that at the end of the day it should be more about the efficiency of how we do those things. So to, to now cast a question and to actually give something back to you is that, do you think that this problem of, for example, uh, the debate about around representations, do you think that has a, has a root in the fact that it is very humanly intuitive to say, well, obviously I see a tree outside and I'm going to take a piece of paper, I'm going to draw it because I have some kind of memory. And so it's intuitive to think that that tree is somehow inside here because I mean, you know, causally there was that connection. Do you think that there is a, and similarly with computation, right? I think computation is a little bit more sophisticated to make the analogy because, but I do think that uh, our model of computation is mostly based on our sequential language and how we sort of conjugate verbs and so on. I mean, I, I don't think there's a deep uh, uh, difference there, but um, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit more uh, out there, but anyway, at least in the representation case, do you think it's connected to the fact that it is at a user level, very intuitive to think, oh yeah, surely there is some remnant and there should be something here. I think so, yeah. I mean, I'm, I usually choose to be, to be extreme and say, this is awful, you know, this, but if you think about it, the, the, 
what we call the computer metaphor for the brain is 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 a good idea you know it's it's a it makes sense i think it's wrong right but it makes sense and it sets the sets the feel such a way that we can do things it, I, I have the same feeling with some with some philosophers like like kant i think kant is the maybe the most important uh, philosopher uh, ever with uh, aristotle and i think he's wrong about everything no, maybe not everything but but i don't know so i think it's 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 very it's very natural for us to 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 think about internal computations in internal uh, models first because of our phenomenology right uh, because i can think about some face and i somehow see it in in my mind right mm. so 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 it is very easy for us to 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 relate whatever is actually going on with our phenomenology of it um it is also easy for us as researchers to think that the way we approach an experiment and the way we describe it is the way it, the the participant is doing it that's that's what what will and james called the psychologist uh, fallacy right like to read into the solution that the participant gives to some experiment whatever we rationalize of it right so that's another thing and then also because computational methods are actually very as you said very effective so so it is easy for us to see after this this effectivity to see that maybe this is what actually it's going on to this i think this happens in physics too right in the thing that it's easy to think that oh no the very fundament as fundamental aspect of the universe is mathematics uh, because if not why they are so effective right mm -hmm. right so it's easy to due to our own phenomenology due to our own scientific uh, practices and due to the effectivity of the computational method you know it's not such a bad idea to let's say it's not such a bad hypothesis to think that something computational mm -hmm. in in some way it's uh, going on there i do think afterwards that when you really think on the details and on, on the conditions an organism should 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 match you know should should fit in order to be a computational system like we are when we do our experiment doesn't happen for the for for uh, the organism but yeah i mean it's quite natural for us to think in those terms in terms of computation internal models representations and that stuff. Yeah, elaborate on this. I mean, exactly the the in this book I mentioned before, representation reconsidered. Uh, Bill Ramsey starts making a uh, the historical point of view you mentioned. It's like actually, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to think that cognition is based on representation because representing is something that we do all the time. So when we speak, we are in a way representing. When if I draw a picture of the tree I have there, I mean, representation is a very human activity. Mm. Uh, in a way, it makes sense to believe for historical phenomenological also for cultural reasons because it's also important not to forget that what is intuitive is also culturally relevant I and mean, it's culturally specific i mean today we read uh, aristotle's uh, theories in the anima and we say what's going on here but it, it makes sense to think that he was in some way resonating to the psyches of the of, of his time and was elaborating on what was intuitive uh, in, in in his time right so in, in this sense it we're surrounded by by uh, machines that compute so it makes a lot of sense for us to think in in terms of computation but as Vicente said before the, the problem with the notion of computation is that it's not better defined than the notion of representation so in computation mean very different things yeah. in different theories so in a way it's, it's impossible to say well tell me what what is computation what is, what, what kind of informational trans transformation encoding decoding you are putting in for me to discuss. Otherwise, it's just it's just impossible. One of the challenges that we that people who try to break with this um, traditional cognitive science, people working in the 4E or in colleague psychology, whatever, is trying to cast new metaphors and new. So, for example, Vicente is working on the on this, this idea of a neural resonance. Is trying to bring back because another problem that that I'm, I think with uh, some reason that we have been accused is that because we we assume that the brain is a representational and computational organ 
then people trying to do something not uh, orthodox cognitive science, we forgot the brain and we don't speak about the brain. <laughs> and I know that Vicente has had this, this um, experience sometimes of people say, no, but the brain is not, not relevant. Well, I mean, we grow a really like metabolically speaking organ there, so it has to play some role. If it's not a presentation, there's something. So must be doing something. And then one of the, the challenges that we have is, is bringing new metaphors that lead uh, uh, philosophical, theoretical, empirical discussion into new ways. Mm -hmm. And see, and in the end, go back to the lab and see which one works better. Yeah, I do think uh, the, the importance you bring up uh, uh, in the first part with respect, with respect to uh, uh, what's culturally relevant uh, and uh, salient to us, uh, like a lot of our encoding uh, and perhaps representation, uh, uh, the strength of that belief uh, could just so happen to be uh, due to you know the dominance of digital computers as opposed to analog computers, uh, where encoding was heavily emphasized um, compared to let's say geometry or mechanical uh, or dyna under a dynamical systems perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes. Uh, I think at this point of the talk, uh, of our discussion, uh, would we like to continue to talk about maybe uh, the challenges of uh, communicating plant cognition to the broader scientific community, since that seems to be, uh, uh, we're talking about the metaphors, um, and uh, perhaps even the general public. Because uh, I know whenever I talk about uh, cognition in plants, uh, it's you know kind of seen as like crack pottery. <laughs> um, and it's like, where, where are the brain and plants and stuff? Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, um, I think this relates to what we just said, right? That what is, what is culturally relevant, how, how, how our uh, culture understand um, uh, intelligence, uh, cognitive systems. It's like, if you think about it, um, I don't know if, if you know who Magnus uh, Carlsen is. He's he's the you know the, the chess uh, player. So if I ask someone, no you know not nobody that that needs to be working in the kind of things Miguel and I work, for instance, who is more intelligent or who is doing a cognitive uh, um, activity that is more more uh, cognitive or more intelligent. Magnus or Leo Messi? I would say that we 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 would say uh, the chess player, right? It seems to us that things like doing math or doing chess is more intelligent. It's more uh, a cognitive activity than than uh, playing soccer, right? So to speak. But then think about how many artificial intelligent uh, systems we have that defeat. Uh, at, at the best chess uh, player uh, easily. I mean, my phone is better than, 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 than uh, uh, the best chess player in, in, uh, in the world now, right? How many robots we have that walk? Well, n n I mean, not, not, to, n n not to say that uh, perform soccer or any other sport in n the best way. We don't have that many. I mean, we don't have any <laughs> actually right so there are things that even though require a level of coordination planning uh, modeling etc blah 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 that is maybe bigger than for chess or than for other activities that we don't regard as intelligent we tend to regard uh, as intelligent doing mathematics but not walking around and walking around is a super complex activity for any organism right uh, and of course if plants are cognitive in any way they are more uh, cognitive than like walk that like walking people that the people doing math so this is a, a first thing that we need to say you know it's sometimes difficult to convince the audience that very simple things like moving around are very intelligent things. Mm -hmm. 
and that when we talk about plants being cognitive system, we talk about that. Of, of course, plants are not going to write to write the book or to you know that's that's or, but there are these other things that we don't usually regard as cognitive that are actually very demanding in terms of the cognitive system doing it and are most likely at the very basis of any other cognitive skills and plants are there if they are uh, cognitive in some way they are there so that said uh, i tend to think that the that the general public is excited about it uh, skeptical or not but they seem to be excited plant physiologists are most of them angry about it um, but but this is interesting too because I think the problem is physiology <laughs> I know and I know this is a bad way to put it but yeah, you know it's it's kind of a joke but when I study ecological psychology behavior and that stuff the people that are in front of me are neurophysiologists and when I study plant behavior and that's that, the people that are in front of me are plant uh, physiologists, uh, because you know they think that they think that we have to build up behavior from single neurons to neural networks to whatever. And plant physiologists are no, you need to start with the genes, right? And then how the genes build up, and so in that way. Uh, in the academia, uh, people who are more physiology minded are uh, very reluctant to 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 see us even as a as a proper science. And those though those people doing ecology and you know and systems stuff are more are uh, more more you know at least open to understand the kind of work we do and finally philosophy um, philosophy is is not as open as we claim to be <laughs> let me say that there's, there's a lot of not openness but you know i i would say that people that are doing philosophy of science are relatively open to think about these things i find a lot of reaction against in people doing ethics and i think there are there are there are two reasons for their reactions in ethics although i could, might be wrong this is that it's just my impression is that first is more a kind of sociological factor you know people doing ethics tend to have a strong opinions in some ethical things like should we eat animals or plants? Should we do these kind of things? And of course, if plants are intelligent, there's uh, something that has to be changed, right? But it's also true. One, one, one of the one of the arguments I get is like, are you telling me that if I leave my dog alone at home for mm, the weekend, it is the same that if I leave my leave my carrot? Uh, alone at home and you know they have a point there <laughs> so there's there's a there's something there but there's also i think an epistemological reason why people working on ethics may may not see the plant intelligent or the plant cognition stuff with good eyes and it's because m most of them many of the most classical ways to regard the mind that I read are from ethics. You know, ethics is all about we are rational beings uh, making decision about to do mm, the good. So the, the very definition of what an agent is or what an intelligent organism has to do with this ra ethical rationality that, of course, that's not plants. You, I don't think plants are rational beings in any, <laughs> in any of those ways, right? So, yeah, kind of a you know, uh, different reactions from different subfields, even uh, uh, within uh, the sciences and, and the humanities. Yeah, so uh, elaborating on this idea, I think that, I mean, when I, because 
this is, this is part of the, of the ongoing discussion I, I usually have with Paco when we try to write up papers and we go to for conferences or for talks. I think, I mean, people working in comparative cognition that are, in general, they only work with animals, they tend to um, point out to four uh, biases that are related. So one is the anthropocentrism, anthropomorphism, anthropofabulation, and anthropectomy. These biases are a problem because when you, so basically the idea in the end is that, yeah, I mean, we take a cognition to be defined from a human point of view and then all the biases come from that, follow from that. And then, then this is why some people are happy to, okay, uh, uh, human beings are cognitive, then animals that are morphologically and phylogenetically similar to human beings are also cognitive, apes, some people, um, assume that dolphins are, but then categorize them as aquatic apes in a way. And then the, the farther you move in the phylogenetic tree from human beings, the more resistant you find. But the reason is, is because of that, because it's because anthropocentrism, anthropo anthropomorphism, anthropofabulation, and anthropectomy. And then when you say, well, uh, you can find some uh, intelligence in, in, in plant behavior. Maybe we can find some intelligence in plant behavior. Then when people assume is intelligence as defined for human beings in terms of rationality. So are you telling me that my plants think? No, I've never said that. What I said is that your plant is able to coordinate the movement with the, with the elements of the environment in an adaptive and flexible way. Stop. And then <laughs> we can keep discussing. But then this is the problem. So then, as Vicente said, when we discuss with physiologists, they don't recognize that because they, don't, they think that what we are doing is irrelevant and is not necessary. Actually, uh, it's famous. Uh, I mean, it was, I think it was uh, Robinson and Ty, so they published a public ledger, I think it was in Cell, uh, asking for, for uh, the funding for Paco's lab to be cut. I mean, I've never wow. seen that ever. I mean, this is published, this is there. And people, scientists say, no, no, please don't give money to this. Why not? What, I, what are you so afraid of? What do you think? Because they, they see us as shamans, something like that. We, we're like dancing. No, we're trying to apply behavioral analysis methods to plants. And if they, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay, let's go down. That's, that's science. I mean, it's not an issue. <laughs> but then it's also these uh, philosophical problems. Like, okay, what do we mean when we when we talk about intelligence, about uh, complex behavior or intelligent behavior? We don't assume. So we are not saying that uh, animals are rational, but I actually think that most of the time human beings are not rational either. So this this is the anthropofabulation part. So we had, we assume that uh, intelligent capacity in humans uh, are defined in very incredibly high standard. But I actually doubt how often we meet those standards. So a classical example of this is, is, is social cognition and the use of theory of mind. So from, I think, the 80s, so people assume that it, for you to be able to achieve social coordination with someone else, you need to have a, a theory of mind. So a theory that relates every behavior with a well-defined set of beliefs, desires, blah, 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 blah. But then, re really, I mean, who, who has that? And then people who assume that say, well, only human beings can. But then you have to explain me how uh, those animals achieve social coordination. And then there were some who said, no, no, actually, yeah, theory of mind is present in more animals. And some people say, no, I mean, what you are observing there is not really social coordination. It's something different. It's, uh, it's, it's something that resembles a, it's a, pale, paid, <laughs> a pale version of it. But in the end, it's like, why don't we start by behavior analysis? Why don't we start by observing what different organisms are doing and then we discuss about the mechanisms that make possible this behavior so why don't we start by the facts instead of uh, making a priori assumptions about what intelligence should be or is yeah i, I wanted to to add to that because um i'm curious to i mean I, I i have talked to paco quite a bit so i i mean he's he's given me a lot of this account but uh, but I, i'm i'm thinking that are you because I find this fascinating, the fact that uh, plant cognition is, is sort of going back to the roots, pun intended, uh, of of uh, the um, of the measurement and the get, gathering the data and you know just going to the behavior and, and sort of trying to apply the methodologies that are that you know are as universal as they get and and to, to the, apply to these systems. Um, do you think you are sort of facing the the monolith of tradition that has come from from all these uh, streams of of uh, intellectual development in the last? couple of centuries or however long they have been, maybe some of them much longer, obviously. Um, so, I mean, how much do you think there is of a sort of a resistance to, to the to the going back to some very primitive approach that sort of does away with a lot of the 
of the established uh, and hard earned in some cases uh, theory uh, and how much of it do you think is honest scientific uh, disagreement uh, of or, and skepticism I think there are there's a little bit of everything I guess there's of I mean of sciences and institution there's an establishment there a mainstream there's funding going here and there right that's that's part of it but that's i think that of course we 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 do in this uh suffer that but but i when i when i teach I don't know, when i teach kant i suffer that right so it's it's not it it might be even more more vocal because of the kind of topic but you know it's it's true that Science as as an institution has uh, processes and funding agencies and people that has more power than other people and that kind of thing. So we suffer that maybe a little bit more because because of 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 the kind of topic we we want to be doing. But I wouldn't say that 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 I don't feel myself. Uh, worse uh, treated when I talk about plant science than when I talk about uh, William James, right? So it's kind of the thing there. I do think that this is something that 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 is how our science works now that might be changed for sure. That's that's a complete different issue. And that's that's a, 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 another thing. But that our only option there is to, is to is to is to try to do Good work and and to put an example here, uh, some of the people that 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 or some of the people that are part of that group that uh, publish this thing saying you should uh, defend all Pagos Lab and all labs of the, of, of, the, of this. Um, our paper on the on the dynamics of plan notation got some uh, traction in in some newspapers and, and that stuff, and we had. And, and, and we had uh, different interviews and that stuff. And in one of them, they were interviewing us and some of these people. And when they asked them for our paper, they said, the science sounds, but something has to be wrong there, right? And, and or, you know, or some interpretation has to be weird. But this is, this is our card, right? That, they 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 cannot say the science doesn't sound there right to what extent this is a proof of something more it's other thing but but we can still this is what we can do 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 proper science for those people who are strongly reacting against the kind of things we do they can claim that we don't do science but here's mm, the paper and and you know, and then um, I do think that in uh, because of this is science too. I do think that in some of these discussions and in some of these mm, eh, there are some mm, personal issues that are going on there. And uh, I'm not going to name names, but some of the actors in both sides have been attacking each other for thirty years now, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them is the editor of blah, blah, blah. The other one is the, the full professor in world, blah, 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 and that stuff. But that's part of science. Science is because that's part of life. People that have built up their own path in some things that you are not going to convince them now that, 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 that they have been wrong for uh, 30 years now. So, yeah, it's a little bit of everything. No, it's, and, and I agree. I totally agree with what Peter said. So I think. As I said, I think there's a lot of resistance comes from um, anthropocentric biases, like this idea for some, I, I mean, you can only speak about plants don't move. Why? Well, because we assume that moves uh, equates locomotion and plants don't locomote. But there's another form of movement, like you know, plasticity, directional growing. Okay, cognition requires brain. Plants don't have brain. Therefore, uh, cognition requires mental representation. Plants don't have mental representation. That's, this is, I mean, all the, all the things that I've been saying are been, have been written. I mean, I can show you the quotes. I'm not, I'm not making that sense. So I think there's a lot of resistance coming from people who, from the beginning, have difficulty believing that we can extend the discussion to plants. But there's also one part that I think is important, is that 
because this topic is becoming trendy in the last decade or so, there are also a lot of um, science being doing and not always good science. So there's a lot of papers that are faulty and I, I, again, I, I won't name names either, but some people that became really famous, when you try to replicate them, you see that many aspects that should be there are not there. I mean, time, time lapses that are not there. So if, if you want to understand uh, the behavioral, so if you want to understand what a plant, plant is doing from a behavioral perspective, you need to do time lapse. Otherwise, you're not doing anything. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's like if you put a, a piece of cheese on a mouse, and then you come back two hours later, and you see the cheese is not there, and you say, well, the mouse eat it. Yeah, but you, I mean, you don't know what happened there. You need to show me what happened there. And there are papers about um, behavioral analysis in plants that they don't have time lapse, hmm. that the statistics are dubious, that the methodological setup, setup is dubious. So there is also part of this. And it's also another problem is that, again, because it's becoming trendy, also when it's communicated something to the general public, sometimes journalists make important mistakes. And I think that Vicente uh, suffered this. I mean, I I've read uh, uh, reports in the general press of your paper talking about, oh, these people discovered that plants are conscious. I'm like, sorry, what? <laughs> and I, you don't mention consciousness in your paper once, and for good reasons, I mean, no. But you see that plants are conscious. Those um, uh, climbing beans are conscious, so sorry. And then <laughs> this is this mixture. So resistant and uh, a prior resistant, sci a science that needs to be properly built up and 10, 15 years, so we need to do that. Uh, and, but, this, but again, that's why we don't do science as Wundt did it in the beginning of the 20th century. We have better methods, okay? Now we have to develop uh, better methods for that. And I think that what Vicente did is, is actually a good, uh, a, a good first step into this direction. And then, issues communicating uh, this that in a way i don't think they are very different to, be very different to the issues in physics i mean how many particles of god have been discovered in the last yeah. 20 years you can expect that that uh, the same amount of, pl of plants will be discovered to be conscious in the next 10 years <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I think it has to be with with also the clickbait yeah. of, of science and general press so i don't know what this is because i because i know that you suffered this so I've been super, super angry about some of the, some of the things in press, but um, it's, it's a, it, it's a, it's a big topic because it's not only about plants. It's only that, you know, um, my paper is for people and the only two people that are consistently referred in the places are me and Paco, the, the curiously, the two guys of the, of, of the, of the four people and like, you know, there are, but yeah, this is another thing. So I don't want to get angry at the end of the talk. So I'm going to say anything. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think, I think, that, I mean, I, as I said, Paco has uh, uh, communicated a lot of this, uh, um, you know, hurdles of, of, of the field uh, and uh, in the past. And I, I wanted to get the first hand from you. So obviously I don't want to open the can of worms and, and go and go revisit that. Uh, but no, absolutely. I think this is this is a great challenge. And if, if I can just uh, uh, do a very uh, short uh, senf plug here, I mean, one of the one of the things that we really stand for when we uh, began this sort of this initiative uh, with senf was precisely this sort of dynamics that I think we all agree are uh, are sort of in in the best situations are the necessary burdens of big administrations and big institutions, and in worst cases are the you know the ill intent of individuals that the you know they have the, their motivations and non alignments and so on uh so one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, set up this this community and and the reason why you know our age group here is not so disparate you know in the, in this in this way is that um i think that there is a necessity there's not almost a, an ecological argument that can be made about institutions and about how how you need constant injection of of sort of a you know, a forum where nobody has anything to lose and, and we just have the time to spend and the energy to spend into doing science for the sake of science and then, and, you know, you know having, the, having the forum to do that, you know. And, and, and I will just say very briefly that it was mentioned how space and the spatial cognition was crucial in many of these questions. We have a conference coming up in, in two or three weeks uh, about, this, about these topics particularly. Unfortunately, we didn't have any plant cognition representation because I, would, I always try to, <laughs> to bring uh, all, all, the, all the possible angles in, in the question. But as you can imagine, space is a, is a very uh, ample and, uh, and, uh, and uh, huge uh, topic. So, but anyway, so, so that's, that's kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to end on, on this kind of notes where, 
we're identifying some of the shortcomings of, of our of, of our intellectual uh, ecosystem because uh, I mean Senf is here basically just to try and uh, and mitigate as much as we can that and, and, and to, to try and foster this sort of this sort of conversations that are you know uh, as, as technical as they might get but also uh, try to be you know go beyond uh, disciplines I mean if you think about disciplines right I mean disciplines at the end of the day are mostly administrative notions right I mean you need funding separated you need buildings with different rooms and you know uh, lecture theaters and you need you know courses organized for th things things like that so at the end of the day I mean we have some disciplinary spread here but if you look at our conference in a few weeks you will see you know the entire spectrum from artists to scientists to you know uh, people from the humanities and mathematicians philosophers all these kinds of things and, and I think that um, it takes some degree of, of uh, openness and, and, and this sort of childlike curiosity to keep on you know looking at these questions and going back at them and, and you know uh, so so I must say I'm, I'm very I'm very pleased that we had this conversation I think it went really really nicely uh, if you want have any final comments or anything to add I'll give you some time but on my side I'm super grateful and thank you so much for being here yeah I just want to point out that for the for the space uh, conference uh, if not a, a, a strictly a plant mm, cognition guy Michael Levin yes I got Michael Levin. Yes. But, uh, yes. I, was, I was actually debating whether I should bring that up to you guys because he's very sympathetic uh, yeah. Yeah, to yeah. a lot of these questions. He, 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 other than the fantastic work on, on bioelectricity and that stuff that is uh, amazing, he, he's, he's part of, you know, of the extended uh, community that work on that. So you kind of have it there too. Um, and yeah, um, I'm... I just want to say thank you for inviting me. This has been super fun, super interesting. And the society itself, I've been uh, watching uh, videos, so all these days looks great. And so keep the good work, guys. Super cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel and uh, Vicente. Yeah, just to, to close up, and I, I, again, thank you so much for, for inviting us for this. It was a really, really nice conversation, so I'm really happy for that. So just adding to my, my previous point, so, I mean, something that Vicente mentioned. So they started to do this experiment in 2015 and they gathered, they gathered the, the final data in 2019. That's not very often. So it's not very often that you have like five years to do one single experiment. So <laughs> he could do that because it was a, a kind of a side project for himself. So also the way science is produced, the way institutions are pushing people to gather and produce uh, and uh, uh, data goes against yeah. the, the so it plays a detrimental role on, on this. So I think I think the, the discussion is double. I think one discussion is, is the, in the philosophy, so it's, it's purely theoretical discussion about what we take to be necessary to talk about intelligence or cognition, and then the other side is the science. So let's let's do that. Let's do it with care. Let's do it with time. But then probably we need a different environment, more chilling for the uh, discussion and also more chilling for <laughs> giving people the time they need yeah. to produce the, that, the data they need to produce. Because otherwise, what we're going to have is experiments that don't replicate or statistics that are 60% of 26. <laughs> so things like that that are not very uh, significant. But yeah, coming back to this, sorry, closing. Uh, thank you so much for, for the invitation. And yeah, I mean, I'm really thrilled to be part of this and. I wish you the best luck for the future, for your conference, and for the next editions of this, post this podcast. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, then. Uh, for our viewers, uh, as usual, you can find us on Twitter, uh, here on, on YouTube, in the future live streams that we do. And yeah, watch out for the conference that's coming up. The, the website is uh, linked here on, on our channel, and, and you can find it easily. And it's open to everyone. Everyone can register and participate. Um, so yeah, look forward to seeing you all again, and see you soon. Thank you. Okay, so we are now offline. Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research, SEMF from its original Spanish acronym, is created in response to the current scientific, social and technological environment. Despite the fast communications and interconnectivity of the information age, most branches of knowledge are still largely segregated, and institutions dedicated to their advancement tend to be managerially complex. 
often constrained by their history and rarely in substantial cooperation with each other. This contrasts with recent developments, showing that today's frontiers of human understanding often lie outside the bounds of traditional disciplines. SEMPF aims to address fundamental questions with rigour and honesty, always striving to consider them broadly, profoundly and contextually. We believe that this type of intellectual endeavour is most likely to flourish in dynamic environments that foster the creative exploration of ideas and the organic growth of research projects and collaborations. SEMPF aspires to provide such an environment by keeping things simple, staying managerially lightweight and being run by a team of active researchers and intellectuals. At SEMPF, we promote rationality and scientific thinking across all human inquiry, since we consider these to be the best tools for development of civilization and the understanding of the universe we all inhabit. Our universalist approach to human knowledge helps us bridge the gap between traditionally disjointed disciplines, particularly the familiar yet limiting divide between the sciences and humanities. This mindset allows us to identify deep themes across diverse topics, a powerful asset when trying to unify separate areas of research. Ultimately, SEMPF aims to establish a pluralistic community of scientists, creatives, academics, artists, students, intellectuals and generally enthusiasts united under the common goal of delving deeper into fundamental questions. In principle, all topics are welcome under the SEMPF dome. However, given its fundamental nature, subjects such as linguistics, physics, cognitive science, mathematics, complexity science, philosophy, biology or computer science are well represented in our events and activities. To accomplish our goals, we currently do three things. We ideate and organise transdisciplinary conferences and seminars. We host the Semphiloquia podcast, where small groups of experts with different backgrounds come together to discuss a transversal topic. And we maintain the Agora, a platform implemented on Discord and Telegram, where our members can self-organise and participate in talks, debates, study groups and social gatherings. All the information about SEMPF can be found on our website, www.semf.org.es. There you can also become a member in a couple of clicks. In our YouTube channel, you can find our live streams and podcast recordings. And follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with all our events and announcements and find us on most other social media platforms.